What does it take to be fast around the streets of Monte Carlo? Around Monaco, you always have to build up to the limit because the limit is never kind. Monaco is all about confidence, and confidence comes from a few different places. First, experience. Experience lets you understand the peculiarities of the track, the bumps in the braking zone, the way the road falls away in certain areas, or how the grip decreases as you drift off the racing line. Confidence also comes from track time. Missing a session in Monaco due to an issue or a crash can be brutal for a driver's confidence. I've also managed to consult an expert regarding things that help around Monaco. Big balls. <laughs> Thanks, James. My name is Blake, and welcome to Break F1. At this point, I'm assuming everybody's seen qualifying and knows what happened, so I'm not going to waste too much time here. The Ferraris outqualified the Red Bull by about 0.4%, which is typical this season. But there's something up with the Ferrari. They seem to have a secret weapon. Leclerc outqualified signs as usual, but there were a few flashes of brilliance from Carlos's fastest lap, which we'll also look at. For the second time this season, Perez has outqualified Max. There's a few interesting points in the data, as well as some very telling comments in the press from Jos Verstappen. Norris hauls the McLaren up to P5 while Ricardo doesn't get out of Q2. We'll have a look at their Q2 laps and see what we can understand. Russell manages P6 in the Mercedes, but this still leaves them nearly 1% off of pole. For the most part, that's been their gap to Ferrari all season. Russell outqualified his teammate Hamilton this weekend, which brings the qualifying head-to-head to 4-3 -head in favor of Russell over the seven-time world champ. Now, I know there's a lot of other interesting stuff that happened in qualifying, but I think we've got plenty to look at. Let's dig through the qualifying telemetry overlays and see what we can learn about these teams and drivers today. Now, if this is your first time seeing a driver overlay telemetry, I'll explain it pretty quickly. On the top axis, we have car speed. In the middle, we've got the throttle. And at the very bottom of the graph, we have the time delta. This will show you if Sainz is ahead here or down here if Leclerc is ahead. This is the start of the lap and this is the end of the lap. Now here's our first comparison between the Ferrari drivers of Sainz and Leclerc. We've got Sainz in blue, Leclerc in red. You can see in turn one, Sainz is able to carry so much more speed into the braking, but not as much speed on the apex. At the exit of turn one, Carlos is 1.5 tenths up on Leclerc. Now, going into turn three and four, Sainz carries a bit of speed in, but Leclerc finds so much more exit speed on the exit of three, and then rolls all that speed through four. Leclerc claws back most of that time. Leclerc is now in the lead by half a tenth. Now, through five, six, seven, eight, Leclerc finds another two tenths over Sainz. Similar speeds through the tunnel, then breaking into the chicane, Sainz does find a little bit of time, but at the exit of the corner, He's only really made up half a tenth between these two points. Sainz also finds a huge chunk of time through the fast left-hander of turn 12, but by the end of the lap, Leclerc has clawed most of that back and Leclerc finishes the lap two tenths ahead of Sainz. Now we're looking at Perez in the Red Bull and Leclerc in the Ferrari. There are two main takeaways from this comparison. Just the same as Leclerc versus Sainz, Leclerc is able to carry so much more speed through turn three and four compared to Perez. Now turn three is pretty punishing. If you end up a little bit offline, the grip just falls away massively. So Perez and most of the other drivers taking quite a bit of margin here. Leclerc embracing his inner James Hunt. Big balls. Now the other thing which I've noticed about Ferrari and almost every other qualifying session I've seen, they have enormous stopping power on the brakes. Look at this into turn five and also look at this here to the chicane, how much more speed they can carry in these places. So there's something up with the Ferrari on the brakes and we'll look into that a bit more in a second. At the exit of turn eight, Leclerc is four tenths of a second up on Perez. Yes, Leclerc does break that much harder exiting the tunnel into the chicane, but in terms of overall compromise, uh, Perez gets a good exit out of here and there's not too much difference in lap time. Now here's another interesting observation. Perez also finds two tenths over Leclerc through turn 12. Clearly Leclerc left something on the table in turn 12, and if he had another lap, I'm pretty sure you'd see Leclerc two tenths up the road on where he finished. Both drivers have a very similar sector three, and at the end of the lap, uh, Leclerc finishes just over two tenths ahead of Perez. I'll come back to some of my ideas regarding Ferrari's braking performance a bit later in the video. Now let's try to understand how Perez got the better of Verstappen in qualifying this weekend. For the first sector, there is very little difference between the two drivers. Max carries a little bit more speed through turn three. Perez gets a better exit out of four. Not much difference there. Verstappen gains quite a bit on the brakes into turn five, but by the exit of turn eight, Verstappen is only a tenth and a half ahead. Now this is where the lap turns around completely. Verstappen huge on the brakes here into the chicane. He's now up to two tenths ahead of Perez, 
but again, going through the fast left-hander of turn 12, Perez claws back nearly two tenths of a second. Now up to Raskast, they are neck and neck, no difference between the two drivers in lap time. Then through Raskast in the final corner, Perez just finds a little edge over Verstappen to give him the advantage. Checo clearly feeling confident and comfortable in the car through the high-speed corner of the circuit, which gave him the edge over Max in this qualifying lap. Now there's also a few interesting things in the press from Jos Verstappen regarding the race, but he also gave us some key information as to what may be giving Checo a performance advantage in some of these circuits over Max. Now, looking at an article from World of Sports, Jos Verstappen is quoted as saying, Max's third place was very disappointing. We all saw that it was a difficult weekend for him. He then continues to go on and mention some things about the car balance. It starts with the car, which simply doesn't have the characteristics for his driving style yet. Max has far too little grip at the front axle, and especially in Monaco with all those short corners, you need the car that turns very quickly. That was just hard. I think it's beginning to become pretty clear that Max needs a car with quite a bit of front end, and he can even drive a car very quickly, which is a little bit unstable, whereas Perez just likes an understeery car, which is well planted. Pacheco did a great job this weekend, Max learning a bit more about the car. Let's see what happens in Baku. Now, Ferrari qualified 0.6% ahead of McLaren of Norris and 1% ahead of the Mercedes of Russell. Those overlays are not particularly interesting, so we're just going to skip those entirely. A lot of you are probably wondering, why did Ricardo qualify so poorly? Or, how did Russell put that much time in Hamilton? Let's have a look. I've used their Q2 laps as Daniel was knocked out in Q3, but this does not look great for Daniel. Now, going through turn one, not too much difference. Lando finding a bit of pace, a little bit through three, a little bit through four. Uh, it looks like Daniel has traffic or has to lift something here through turn five. That costs him a quarter of a second. Through five, six, seven, eight, not much between the two drivers. Maybe Daniel getting a little bit of a toe through the tunnel. Uh, Norris throwing the anchor out and finding several tenths on the brakes. Daniel gets a decent exit. Uh, Norris faster through turn 12, but not too much lap time gained between them. Then from the swimming pool, Rask cast in the final corner. Yeah, Lando finishes three quarters a second up on Daniel. Looking through this, I that looks like traffic. On the brakes, Norris is just stronger everywhere. Yeah, he lifts off a little bit. But look at how much speed Lando can roll into this. Like, this looks like a driver that is not comfortable in the car at all when you see the red lines of Ricardo. No confidence in the car, not able to carry any rolling speed, even through the low speed. Ricardo didn't have the pace to get into Q3, even if you remove this, maybe traffic or something else. So, now I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to see this overlay. Let's talk about Russell versus Hamilton in Q3. We've got Russell in blue, Hamilton in red. Through turn one, Russell finds a tenth of a second. Then through three, four, he finds another tenth over Lewis. Breaking, not much different into five. Six, seven, eight, George is now a further tenth up the road. Breaking out of the tunnel, Lewis gains a little bit back, but going through turn 12, Russell finds another tenth and a half, almost two tenths by the exit. Through the rest of the lap, they trade back and forth. There's a little bit difference in lines, but Russell finishes, you know, four tenths up the road on Lewis. Looking at it, it doesn't look like Hamilton was particularly comfortable in any of the higher speed corners. Turn one, turn three, turn 12, just not really working out for Lewis. Like it looks like he just doesn't have any confidence throwing the car in. I mean, this is definitely a, a braking zone. This is a, you know, a break and bleed into the corner. Uh, and this one is just throw it in. Lewis pretty far off in these corners and that's where most of the damage was done. Not too bad in the low speed, but you know, Russell's clearly more happy with the car here. So really another tough weekend for Lewis. And it seems like we might have some interesting thoughts on uh, the higher speed stability, maybe not favoring Lewis in this car. I think one thing that's very clear is neither Lewis nor Daniel are particularly comfortable with their car and its characteristics. Ricardo appears to be very sensitive to entry stability, and it looks like he just can't use the brakes to turn the car in like he wants to. Hamilton, on the other hand, seems very hit or miss with the Mercedes W13. Over the next few weeks, I'll try and dig into this and understand a little bit more. Now, regarding the braking performance of the Ferrari, at almost every event that I've looked at this season, Ferrari are absolutely dominant on the big stops. I can really only think of a few scenarios that make it possible for one car to brake that much harder than another, considering they've got the same tires. Number one, do they have substantially better mechanical grip? This might mean they found a trick with their suspension that the other teams have not figured out yet. 
They do look very strong in all speed ranges, but there could be something giving that extra braking potential. Number two, do they have a different amount of grounding at the end of straight when they're applying the brakes? This would allow them to attack the initial braking zone much more without excessive grounding and bottoming, but I haven't seen too much to think that this is the reason. Now, number three, Ferrari could have different brake material to their competitors. Without saying too much, there are a few different brake material suppliers in Formula One. Have their brake manufacturers made advancements or developed a material specifically for them that helps them brake so much later and harder? Those are really the only few explanations I can think of. Now, we've got another street circuit coming up next. Well done, Baku. It's a combination of low speed 90 degree corners and a few long straights. Baku shares a few similarities with Monaco in terms of cornering speeds, but it will push teams further away from their biggest downforce package due to the importance of straight line speed down the main straight. The Ferrari and Red Bull should have a reasonable gap to the rest of the field here. Both of them have excellent straight line speed and very strong low speed mechanical grip. I do think you'll see the Ferrari finding a bit of lap time everywhere on the brakes, but both Max and Checo have shown that these kind of circuits are kind of their jam. Now, if you're still wondering what happened with the Ferrari strategy in Monaco, be sure to check out the latest video that I've left here for you. We'll see you next time.